Professor Marchin is the Lincoln Professor of Emerging Technologies, Law, and Ethics at the College of Law at Arizona State University. He's highly educated with a PhD in genetics from the University of the British Columbia, a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government, and a JD from Harvard Law School, so he is one of us. Professor Marchant. Okay, thank you. I always fun to come and talk about technology and the technology doesn't work, so I'm just sort of waiting for my slides to, to get going here. Um, but, but before uh, they're, they're up, I'll just uh, try and uh, fill space and, and, and get going uh, without them. But um, so I'm glad to be here. This is sort of going to be a little bit different. You've had a, a fascinating meeting, I can tell from the program and from the, the events I attended today, uh, with all kinds of really serious issues. I'm going to be talking about serious issues, but maybe a, a little bit different, sort of looking to the future, looking to the forward, uh, what's coming down the pipe. And, and the, the bottom line is we're in a very, very unique uh, point in, in human history where we're going to have so much change uh, occurring in the next few years because of technology as well as other things like eco economics and, and politics and international issues are all changing our world too, but technology is changing just at an unprecedented pace, right, as, as we speak today. And um, so what I'm not going to, I'm not going to be talking to you really about science fiction. One of my uh, slides would say at this point, uh, quoting a, a famous science fiction writer, William Gibson, that it's too late to write about science fiction. Every time he tries to write about science fiction now, he finds out we're already doing this. Uh, that there's so much happening so quickly that the, the, the stuff we read as kids, even though we don't have flying cars still, uh, what we do have is, is really amazing. And at this point, I would show you another slide that would have a, a slide. Yep. Um, if you say next slide, he'll, he'll, he'll okay. do the. OK, so first slide. Any slide? <laughs> okay. OK, all right. Technology, it's wonderful. So anyhow, here's William Gibson saying it's, it, you can't do anything uh, because it's already been done. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is not science fiction. It's not what's in the future. It's what's here today. These are real technologies with real products, with real companies, and real court cases on everything I'm going to talk to you about today. But it's just the very leading edge of what are going to be these revolutionary changes. They're just going to uh, throw our whole world upside down in the next five years, going to create all kinds of new challenges for law and governance as well. Uh, and uh, many of these are things you just wouldn't believe. So Joe Garreau, Washington Post writer, said in this book, the gulf between what engineers and scientists are actually creating today and what we'll find believable is significant. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are probably things you've heard about, but I'm sure uh, for each of us that there's going to be stuff here you've never heard about. So we're in this very unique period of change where if you look at, say, the last century, I sort of I count four fundamental transformative technologies, uh, the car, the airplane, the computer, and the television. Each of those uh, really changed our lives in all kinds of first, second, and third degree uh, ways that we, we couldn't really anticipate at the time. We're still uh, learning about now. Just for example, how kids today, brains are actually different when you brain scan them because they're multitasking with all their little devices and so on. These, these fundamental changes are occurring. We, we, we're not really even aware of them yet. Um, what's unique about today is we're having equally numbers of transformative technologies, but not spread over 100 years, all right now, all coming at the exact same time, essentially, converging and overlapping in all kinds of interesting and unexpected ways. These have been sort of percolating in the labs for years. People have known they're coming, and all of a sudden, they're hitting the marketplace, hitting reality all this uh, decade as, as we speak. Um, we, we're doing a, a, a PBS documentary on this called Future Tense, looking at what we call these green technologies of how they're creating all these novel uh, new issues for our life. One of the key things is that the change is going at an exponential pace. We don't think exponentially, we think linearly. But these things are coming at just an unprecedented clip of how fast they're coming. You know, it used to take a technology 50 or 60 years to, to get to half the marketplace. Now it's taking one year. It's just so much quicker than anything we've experienced before. So we're in this period of unprecedented change, as Chief Justice Robert in his confirmation, uh, paraphrased by uh, Jeff Rosen, politicians and judges for that matter should be wary of the, the assumption that the future will be little more than an extension of things as they are. We tend to wake up every day and think it's just the same as yesterday, but the reality is we are in a period of just immense speedy change. Um, and then Woody Allen changes them inevitable except from vending machines, but I'm going to have to get rid of this slide soon because vending machines don't have change anymore. So anyhow, so what I want to do is just go through a few of these technologies and then uh, try and end with just sort of the, some of the, the, the key uh, sort of governance and, and policy issues I think that this uh, unique period sort of is creating for us. So let me start with uh, genetics. This is uh, futures now in genetics. We've been hearing about this for a long time. But it really is here now. 
This is the number of commercially available genetic tests that are now available. It's just about hitting 2,000. That means there's, your doctor can go and test you for 2,000 things right now. They're commercially available. There's several thousand more in university labs. And it's amazing the types of things they can test you for. And it's not like it used to be. where We just have these few very rare genetic diseases that only a few unfortunate families had. These now affect us all. Every single one of us in this room has very important medical genes that you can test for now. These are just a few of the, the major disease susceptibility genes that these are present in 1%, 5%, 20% of the population. There's several hundreds of these. That means everyone in this room has 20, 30, 40 or more of these genes that are affecting your risk of these major types of diseases. And if you want to know, you could find out. And other people could find out. And the question is, how are we going to use that information? What are we going to use it for? The government's goal is within five years, you'll have your entire genome on a chip for, for uh, $1,000. Uh, a lot of people think it'll be a lot shorter than five years. It'll be within the next year or two. It's already down to $50,000. Uh, Harvard's doing this personal genome uh, project where they're sequencing the entire genome of 1,000 people uh, this year. And the, the idea is you'll have your entire genome on a little chip. And, and you can only begin to think about how that will be used in just a myriad of different ways, uh, for good and for bad. In the meantime, you can go and get tested right now. Uh, there's these, all these different companies. You have little spit uh, parties in New York City now where people are spitting into a little vial, finding out things about themselves. For $500, these are my genetic test results. Uh, it's 90-something different diseases they're telling me my genetic risk of. Uh, I'm the one that's worse for me is prostate cancer, it turns out, but there's a bunch of others. There's a bunch I'm at reduced risk for, I'm happy to find out about. Over on the right is a whole bunch of these uh, carrier genes, like cystic fibrosis. One in 25 of us have that gene. If I was to have more children I ha and I had that gene, I'd want to know, if, because if my wife has it, that means we have a one in four chance of having a kid with cystic fibrosis. I can now find this out. It's just part of this routine test along with 25 other things. It includes the BRCA1 gene. If I'm a woman and I, that test positive, that means I have a 50-80% chance of breast cancer. That's very important information. This is all available now for all for 500 bucks. It tells me all kinds of funky stuff of different traits about me. It tells me I, I, I probably do like Brussels sprouts. There's this bitter tasting gene. Uh, you can find out on Thanksgiving, you have people coming to your dinner, who, who should have Brussels sprouts or not. It tells me I have blue eyes. It tells me my eye color. It tells me all kinds of things about myself correctly. Um, and it tells me which drugs, uh, which uh, pharmaceuticals will work for me, which won't, which ones I need to be uh, concerned about. Over on the left, it has your genealogy. It tells you your ancestry, where you come from. And what's really cool is it sends you emails from people who are related to you. Here's a second cousin. Do you want to meet them? Here's a third cousin. And you decide whether you want to meet them or not. And this is all for 500 bucks. In another year or two, it'll be 100 bucks, I'm sure. And uh, it's updated automatically for free. Every couple weeks, I get new emails of new genes that affect me. So it's just, it's just incredibly amazing to find this out about yourself. When I got a, a, an email saying my results are available, I was all excited. And all of a sudden, I sort of got cold feet. It took me about 48 hours to have the guts to open it. It's just really profound when you think about it. This is you on there. The thing is, you're leaving your DNA everywhere. The FBI just did a thing where they can get the, the, in the dust in the corner of the room, separate genomes from 300 people from us being in this room today. Because our, we're shedding hair and cells, it's kind of gross, I know, but they're all floating in the air, and by tomorrow morning, they're all going to be dust in the corner of the room. And obviously, for terrorist protection and things, they want to be able to figure out who was in a room. Well, all kinds of other people can do this, too. When you take a drink from a glass or, or um, a cigarette butt or, or chewing gum or whatever, you're leaving uh, DNA behind, and people can now call like that. There's a recent story in New Scientist about four, uh, 30 to 40 uh, commercial labs across the country. There's one in Phoenix where I live, for example, where you can go in with a glass, you can go in with a bed sheet, you can go in with your spouse's underwear, and they'll tell you whose DNA is on it. And you can find that out if you want to know. And there's no law against it. Uh, here's a case of a, 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 a small business dispute case where uh, one of the party and the lawyer started getting these anonymous uh, threatening letters, and they suspected it was the other party. Uh, the, the party denied it in front of the judge, so they took them into a, a, the law firm and took a deposition of them, took the drinking glass he drank from, took the DNA off that, matched it to the uh, saliva on the envelope that had dried, and showed it was he who sent the letter, and the judge found he basically perjured himself. Politicians have to be concerned about this. Uh, movie stars, I mean, uh, every time you go somewhere now, you're leaving your DNA behind. What if Ronald Reagan in the 80 campaign, I don't know if his Alzheimer's was genetic or not, but what if someone had taken his drinking glass, DNA profiled it, and, and made a big deal about that? That could be incredibly uh, embarrassing and, and, and intrusive, intrusive of a p politician or anybody else who's in the public uh, sphere. Apparently now the Secret Service, whenever our president goes anywhere, they take everything he touches and, and incinerate it just to prevent people from getting their DNA. Um, 
First of all, it's medicine. Uh, basically, drug side effects are killing about 100,000 people a year in this country. It's the fifth leading cause of death. It's because mostly you have the wrong gene for the wrong drug. We now know what those genes are. And uh, people from the FDA will come and tell you, you know, for many of these things, we should be testing patients before you get a drug prescription. Most doctors haven't had genetics in medical school. They've only started teaching that recently. So what we're starting to see is just a wave of lawsuits coming right now, suing doctors when people are dying and getting sick, when you know there's a genetic test available to t determine whether you should take that drug at all or what dose you should take, and doctors aren't doing the genetic test. One of the problems is health insurers aren't going to pay for the test. So you get a drug prescription, you go do your $10 copay, and you also get the $3,000 bill for the genetic test. The patients aren't going to be very happy about that, but we're, we basically got this technology suddenly in front of us, and we don't know how to handle it. And where it's ending up is going to be in the courts. We have cases now where people are, are making a murder defense gene. A case of this went to Phoenix, from Phoenix to the US Supreme Court two years ago. And they ruled five to four he'd waived his right to, to introduce that evidence, and he was just executed actually two weeks ago, but he was basically adopted at age six months uh, into a, an upper middle class family, but came from a family of just everybody, every male was basically a, a convicted criminal or murderer or killed in a police shootout. He made this defense, he had a murder gene, and, and in this case, uh, they held it was, he waived his right to introduce that in mitigation. It's interesting, it went to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said the fact he may have a murder gene is all the more reason to execute him, maybe not less, because he can't <laughs> control himself. So it's hard to know how this will come in, but there's just a case in Tennessee two months ago where it was a horrible murder, uh, completely pre-planned, uh, brought as a capital murder case, and the defendant got himself genetically tested, showed he had a gene that can predispose you to violence if you've had a bad upbringing, and the jury, instead of convicting him for a capital murder, convicted him for manslaughter instead. So this is already being used in, in court cases here in the United States, and I'm aware of about another 10 cases at least in the United States where this defense has already been used. So this is here today, people are using it. We can have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where you can take an in vitro fertilized embryo, pick off one cell, it doesn't seem to affect the rest of the embryo, and, and test it for any of these 2,000 traits. And you do that with all 10 or 20 embryos you get, and you decide which kids you want. Do you want the boy or the girl? Do you want this color hair, this color eyes? Uh, and all kinds of traits you can look for, disease, susceptibility genes. People are now using this, for example, if they're, if they're deaf, to select for other deaf embryos. Um, and now there's genetically available tests that claim to test for things like uh, athletic ability that are commercially available, uh, intelligence that are commercially available. And you can now start testing your embryo for these traits. And over 10,000 babies have been born in the United States using this, and we've never had a congressional hearing on this. This is designer babies are here today, and if you want to, you can uh, do it. China is not waiting. They're now setting up these camps of kids who test very strong on these genetic tests. They're picking them out in the first year or two and putting them in special camps as leaderships uh, for their future leadership. So this is happening uh, today. So that's genetics. Another huge technology is surveillance systems. We have all kinds of funky technologies. I love smart dust is my favorite. Uh, but are basically can uh, tell where you're at, uh, uh, spy on us when we're not uh, where we are. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, GPS. This is using satellites to determine where you are. Uh, there's an E911 rule that requires basically all cell phones to tell where you're at. So as we're sitting in this room, unless you've got the battery out of your cell phone, even if it's turned off, a record is being kept of your location today, right now. And it's actually been kept for many years in, in, these, uh, uh, in the service provider's databases. And the question is, who gets access to that information? How could it be used? So companies are using this in a positive way to, to, to do uh, services, what are called location-based services. There's just all kinds of ingenious new products coming out. Uh, my favorite one is these friend finding services are just starting here, but they're very popular in Japan and Korea, where basically um, uh, younger people primarily are putting into their cell phone what they're looking for in a potential mate. And when they get within 50 feet of a match, there's a distinctive ring goes off the room, and you look around <laughs> to see whose uh, phone went off. And hopefully it's not three or four of you. This is something funky that uh, a lot of young people are using this service called Loop T, where you basically put all your friends' coordinates, their GPS <coughs> coordinates into your cell phone, and you can tell in real time where they are. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can see, for example, when you go to the mall, who else among your friends is there and where are, where are they? Who's at home on a Saturday night, doesn't have anything fun to do? Who's sleeping at whose house? And accordingly, I was talking to some uh, high school students of, of a colleague of mine was saying that it's really cool to ever, I mean, it's seen as really uncool to ever turn it off. You can turn it off so they can't track you, but that's a, a mark of you're uncool. So the, the social custom is you leave it on all the time, which means all your friends know where you are at any second within a few feet. Most of us find that creepy, but a lot of young people, this is the way they do it. 
There's all kinds of these services now on Facebook, Google, and so on that are basically tracking where you are and not only tracking where you are, making, allowing you or, 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 or making it so your information goes public on Twitter or whatever uh, service you're using where you're at and you're making this publicly uh, declaration. So now there's these people who are using this to rob you. When you t show you're, uh, you're in Hawaii, they're coming to your house and robbing you. And there's just a, a ring of people in New Hampshire, for example, who just got uh, tr uh, caught basically using this technology to rob people who aren't home. This is being used to track all kinds of people. Companies are using this to track their employees, greatly increasing efficiency by, on average, about 30%. It turns out a lot of people, when they are in, in various types of, of trucks and so on, spend a lot of time at the bar or restaurants. And uh, when they know they're being watched, they, it changes their pattern a lot. So you get a lot more efficiency. But it also creates a sort of feeling of, of pressure. I, I heard an interview from one uh, employee saying, you know, now when I go in to get a Coke and stop to get a Coke and there's just three people in front of me in line, I get really annoyed because I know my employer's watching and say, why are they in a convenience store for 10 minutes? What are they doing? So you sort of feel this constant watching of you kind of thing. Uh, parents are using this to track their children. You can do what are called geofencing, draw a line on a map. If your child goes outside of that zone, you get a real-time phone call telling you in real time they're no longer in that area. Or you can set the speed limit. You can say if they're going above 60 miles an hour, I want a real-time phone call uh, telling me they're doing this. Uh, one father who keeps track of everywhere his uh, teenage son goes just successfully defended a, a speeding ticket in California because he has complete records of where his son was and how fast he's going and, and challenged the speeding ticket to say he wasn't going over the speed limit at the location the police officer said he was. Uh, spouses are doing this to track their partners. Uh, um, and then there's a huge problem of GPS stalkers. All kinds of people are now using this to track people. You can buy a little device and put it in their pack sack or their suitcase or their uh, trunk of their car. Uh, Albert Bell, the, the, the former all-star baseball player, just got criminally charged in Phoenix, where I am, where he was basically broke up with his girlfriend. And everywhere she went, there he was. Whatever party or restaurant she went to, he would somehow show up. He, she went over a speed bump, and something fell off the bottom of her car, and it was this little device. And she looked into it, and sure enough, it was a GPS device. But people are marking these as a sharper image, you know, uh, hidden wireless GPS secretly tracks anything. Um, I can't even read the writing there, but you know, your kid, your spouse, whoever you want, you can basically track them secretly. Here's a guy who talks to the New York Times. He says he's got one of these things. He's intrigued by the possibility of stashing one of these in the, in the uh, trunk of his wife's car. I'm not expecting or, or hoping or wanting to find anything, but I'd just like to explore the possibilities. I'll tell her about it later. And then he tells the New York Times reporter this, right? So I'm sure she, her, she might have probably got a few phone calls. This has become a huge legal issue. Uh, many uh, courts are now getting these kind of cases where the police are using it either to put it on a car, uh, uh, underneath a car, for example, or to use cell phone records. And the question is, does this require a search warrant? We're almost certainly going to get a Supreme Court case on this. We've got uh, contradictory opinions now from the Ninth Circuit and the, and the DC Circuit, for example. It's you know a brand new issue. And you know how this fits under old doctrines is, is, is a challenging question that courts are, tr are struggling with. Um, last year, Sprint said that they got 8 million requests request from police alone to, to ping uh, users, to, to, to basically tell the police where a user is at any one time. Um, it has all kinds of uh, powerful uh, ways of solving crimes. One innovative way now is if a crime is committed on a certain street corner, they can go and ask the cell phone providers, tell us who of your subscribers is on that street corner in that one hour period, and then go uh, interview those people to see if they're either suspects or witnesses. So just incredible, powerful technology to basically find where any of us are at any time in the last few years. And you could just imagine the, the uses of that, the beneficial uses, but also sort of some of the more scary ones. All kinds of new applications coming along. A lot of the car insurance companies now are going to give you a 10% discount if you agree to be tracked. They're not going to change your premium right now. They just want to collect data. But the idea is in the future, they're going to charge you less if you drive less or drive slower or whatever. So they're trying that out. Uh, the Secretary of Transportation, the previous administration, put out a report to basically that if we go, we basically pay for highways using the gas taxes. More and more cars or electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles no longer pay for ta uh, gas. We need a new model. And the model being looked at in several states are now running prototype programs is to put a GPS in your car and charge you based on how many miles you drive. That will now create a complete record of where everywhere your car goes. The Netherlands is going to implement that uh, next year in 2012. Uh, you can have remote braking for speeding vehicles and new GM cars with the OnStar. They can now stop a car remotely with the OnStar system. So a voice comes over the intercom on the car saying we're about to, to stop your car. Obviously someone's stolen it or something like that. And please 
pull off the road. One of the problems is a lot of these criminals don't pull off the road. They just keep on driving. And then you have to stop them in the middle of a highway. Um, so you know, there's documents that will only work at the locations you only can be viewed at the location you specify. Guns, if you want a gun for home protection, but are concerned someone could steal it and use it elsewhere, you can code it so it will only work at that location. So just, you know, just tons of new products uh, uh, using this technology. But it's also creating a lot of concerns about privacy. As, as more and more people use these technologies, not just the police, but civilians, uh, is this the world we want to go into? And what's really fascinating about privacy law, of course, is both the common law and the constitutional standard is based on our reasonable expectation. So if our expectation goes down, so does our legal protection. And so when you hear quotes like this from the CEO of Sun Microsystems, you already have zero privacy, get over it. Or Judge Kaczynski, uh, who recently wrote, uh, 1984 may come a bit later than predicted, but it's here at last, is that mean our legal protection goes down with our expectation? Uh, an interesting question. Uh, another technology is nanotechnology. Um, this is a uh, science of the super small. When you deal with things at a very small level, they have all kinds of unusual properties. So for example, you take gold. When we're used to gold, it's inert. It's gold in color. It's solid. It doesn't conduct electricity. At the nanoscale, it's red. It's liquid. It's incredibly reactive. And it does all kinds of great things. Uh, we're talking very small here. A nano meter is how long my hair grows when I say the word nanotechnology. My hair just grew one nanometer. I've only got a little bit left. Um, so it's very, very small. We're, you know, microscopic small, but things do great things there. And there's tremendous excitement about this. Uh, both sides of the political aisle of, of Democrats and Republicans talking about this being a real future of our technology. Some estimates from both Wall Street and the government is that this will be a, a $3 trillion industry by 2014. That's about 15% of the world economy. What's amazing about this technology is every major corporation in America essentially is now using it for all kinds of different products. It has just an immense number of applications. There's over a thousand confirmed products already on the market, including better uh, golf clubs and, and tennis rackets, but some other really funky stuff too. Um, stain resistant pants is one of the first ones on. That was nanotech. You can now buy socks that you can wear every day for 30 days and they don't smell. My students like those. Uh, Self-cleaning glass. Uh, people are talking about your windshield rifles will be obsolete in two years. This glass cleans itself automatically. So you no longer have to wash your windshield or your, your shower doors or whatever. Uh, there's uh, these food spoilage systems on, on the market this year. Smart Dust, 100 companies are uh, uh, developing these that you put them in the environment and they monitor for things like uh, bioterrorism weapons or, or you if you're there or uh, if, uh, illegal drugs are there. Uh, and then probably the most exciting development is in, in cancer treatment. The most exciting uh, prospects of cancer drugs right now are nanotech drugs, just doing remarkable things. You can do things like take a single cancer cell, inject it in a mouse, and then come the next day and put these things in and find it in just a few minutes. It's just remarkable power. One of the big concerns about cancer is it metastasize. It usually isn't the, the initial tumor that kills you, it's the ones that spread, and we have no way of tracking those now. This can allows you to track where every single uh, cell goes. Just remarkable power. So incredible uh, plus sides. But there's also concerns. It's a New York Times story. Some of these nanotubes may pose a health risk similar to asbestos. Some seem to act in our lung like asbestos fibers. Other ones are, seem to be completely inert. We have no way to predict which are which right now. There's 50,000 different versions of carbon nanotubes. Some to be, seem to be completely inert. Some seem to be like asbestos, and, and we haven't tested the vast majority of them. And none of the traditional methods we use toxicology with work for nanoparticles. So we're completely up in the air, but we have huge potential benefits and, and also possible huge risks. And so what do we do about this? This is one of the big challenges. Uh, just to give you a personal anecdote, I was at a Christmas party two years ago, came back from a nanotech meeting, and three of the women on my block sit, were, asked me where I was, and when I told them what nanotech is, they said, oh, this is horrible. We should, we should ban it. The next year, unfortunately, one of them got a very serious type of cancer, walked up to me on the street and said, I'm so excited about this nanotechnology. It's, it's my hope of, of, of a cure. And I said, uh, Sheila, last year you wanted to ban this stuff. And she said, I did. Why would I want to do that? So it really uh, depends, you know, which way you look at this, and there's really huge benefits and really maybe some risks. A third, another technology is brain scanning. Uh, we're using these new techniques like functional MRI to do all kinds of things with your brain, to tell all kinds of things. Uh, there's a study recently where they can take 500 objects, uh, tell you to look at one on the list and think about it, and tell you with about 90% accuracy just by scanning your brain which you're thinking about. They can use this to tell if you're a Republican or Democrat with about 90% accuracy by just scanning your brain. All kinds of racial animus, all kinds of uh, different things they can do. Uh, one of the first to hit the legal system is an MRI lie detector to basically 
scan your brain to see if you're telling the truth. In controlled studies in the laboratory, the question is, is this realistic for more emotional cases? They get it about 90% right, which is much higher than the polygraph. Mark Twain sort of got it right a long time ago. When you tell a lie, it's a much more complicated when you tell the truth. And that's what the brain scan's measuring. It's measuring a lot of different parts of your brain get activated if you're telling a lie. You have to sort of think what you said before and strategize. Telling the truth is a lot more simple, and the brain scan can distinguish between those. So we've had a couple cases this year where these have been tried to introduce in US courts with mixed success. There's companies that are commercially available marketing this now, like this is one no lie MRI, and you can see one of their policies is to try and get this used in, in the judicial system. And it's going to raise all kinds of issues of, of you know, do defendants use this, do uh, witnesses use this, do jurors use this, uh, uh, w under what standards. People are already going in off the street, you pay $1,500 and you can get brain scan to tell the truth. We have, you know, uh, people going who've been claimed by their spouse is, is not that for being infidelity. You go in and get a scan or a small business owner accused of, of, of arson by his insurance company went in and got a scan. A priest who is charged with a child molestation went in and got a scan. So this is, can be pretty accurate, but again, it's only 90%. What if you get the wrong result, right? If you're the priest and you really didn't molest anybody and you go in there and it comes out the wrong way and your superiors are there, I mean, you're, you're totally uh, sunk then. So it's a very interesting technologies. It's also now being used in all kinds of criminal cases. I'm working on a paper right now. We now have 150 cases in the United States where this has been introduced or tried to be introduced in criminal cases to argue some kind of diminished capacity on behalf of a, a criminal defendant, mostly in the mitigation stages, getting all kinds of different responses from courts and juries all across the country. Here's our future, your politicians or your city councilors or your political debates. Everyone's going to be hooked up to an MRI brain scanner and you're going to be able to see if people tell the truth or not kind of thing. But again, this amazing technology just come up in the last couple of years, all kinds of applications. Then my final big one is, uh, is virtual worlds. Uh, this is one second life. There's about 13 million people who use this, many 20 or 30 hours a week. I don't know how they get the time. But th this isn't, this isn't a, a game. This is doing real stuff in there. Here's Judge Posner with his avatar giving a speech in Second Life recently. There's all kinds of speeches and poets and musicians who perform in there. Political campaigns have things there. Companies have sites where they do a lot of their online meetings now. Uh, and there's all kinds of illicit things going on there as well. What's really important about it, though, is they have their own currency called a Linden dollar that you just press a button and it automatically converts back and forth to your bank account or credit card. So this is real money we're talking about. Uh, so some people, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there started to be these ATMs popping up and one guy uh, owned all these ATMs that people put their Linden dollars in and one guy just closed his account and walked away with $700,000 US dollars worth of money because the FDIC doesn't regulate banks in Second Life yet. Um, all kinds of, this, this statistic just staggers me. If people spend a significant amount of time in there, which is a lot of young people, 53% of the females say their best friend in life is another avatar. They have no clue who that person is, but that's their best friend in life. So people are basically living their lives in these virtual worlds. You now have a Second Life Bar Association. You have some lawyers who are actually practicing in Second Life. Uh, you, you have a, a bunch of cases in US courts now from Second Life. So this is real stuff. Uh, here's a, a fascinating story from a Wall Street Journal about a, a person in Phoenix a few years ago. He's not doing so well. He's got diabetes. He's working in a call service center, not a very glamorous job. He comes home every night and goes on Second Life and has become this studly looking character there and has opened all these businesses, strip clubs, basically. I don't know why people would pay to go watch a digital avatar strip, but apparently some people do. And he's uh, got a, an estate, they think, worth over a million US dollars in Second Life. He's married in the real world. He's gotten married in Second Life. Second Life performs marriages. It's a community property jurisdiction, they claim, to this woman who lives in Edmonton, who he's never met in person. But together, they own these businesses. And he has this wonderful life there, spends all his time on the weekend and every night there. Uh, and his wife is saying, what gives? I mean, uh, he, she went up to him and, and said, you know, spend time with me. He says, this is where I now live. If you want to deal with me, come here. What if he was to die? You know, he has a million dollar estate in Second Life. Who gets that? His common law, his community property wife in Second Life, who lives in Edmonton, or his real world life? Uh, some judges are going to have to decide this someday. All kinds of other issues. The, uh, uh, is this money taxable? The IRS is doing an investigation of this jurisdiction. All kinds of these other things. But you know, this whole issue of people spending their time in Second Life. The philosopher uh, Robert Novak asked this many years ago. What would this mean if people start to do this? Well, that's what they're starting to do now. So you can see just from these five examples, there's a whole bunch of technologies. Let me just run through a number of others very quickly. Here's an, uh, an idea that uh, uh, 
companies are now developing meat grown in a laboratory. I thought it was kind of frivolous until I was at a presentation, people talking about the environmental benefits of this would just be hum immense. It turns out cows have a lot of flat chillance that causes global warming, but also all the grazing uses up a lot of land. That if they instead grew this meat in vats, we would save a lot of money and you could just grow it as teriyaki or barbecue, whatever you want. Uh, PETA is actually subsidizing this. They're putting money into it, a million dollars, because they think it's a good idea. And just a few weeks ago, there was a very disturbing article in New Scientist suggesting that probably the healthiest meat would be actually be human meat, that it would actually be the best for us. And so it kind of creeps me out, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's what people are talking about. Here's a fascinating story from the Washington Post about robo-insects, these robo-bugs. There's a, a demonstration in, in, in Washington, D.C. about three years ago, and a number of people who weren't kooks went to the Washington Post and said, we thought we saw little flying robotic insects. So the science writer at the Post at that point went and did an investigation, found eight or nine different federal agencies actually developing these. Said none of ours are out in the field, but we're surprised to learn there's seven, seven other agencies developing these. And a lot of information's come out about these scents, and they make a lot of sense from the military perspective. If you're in the Middle East, some Somewhere and you're, you have a building there, there's a, there's a great video one of the, the defense contractors produced on this. You're a soldier, you don't know what's in this building. I mean, it's very risky for you to walk in there. Uh, a lot of soldiers get killed doing that. Plus, you get a lot of innocent uh, civilian deaths when you don't know when someone's in this dark building. You shoot and it's, it turns out to be someone who's innocent. And so they show this little robo fly going into the building, going up to the second floor, seeing some family and some kids sleeping there, going up to the third floor and then seeing some guys with some ro um, 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 grenade launchers there and, and be able to strategically hit them. So these are, are, are being developed for the military. They're being used now in some prototypes in military situations. Um, the question is, what happens when these get out in the civilian sector, right? What if you can go buy at the, my spy shop a little robo-insect that can go anywhere and, and these, you know, take surveillance and send it back remotely, automatically? Uh, what would be private anymore? I mean, would any boardroom or any bedroom ever be private again? Remember when that uh, video last summer of Obama swatting the fly, right? Next time it's going to be a little robo-fly in the White House. How would you keep a fly out of the White House? How would you keep a fly out of anywhere? So uh, we're getting these technologies that, are, again, have a huge military benefit, but how do we uh, control them in the civilian uh, uh, context? Synthetic biology, you may have saw a few weeks ago, we created the first digitally created life form, where we basically uh, took four chemicals and genetically, uh, on a computer, created a, a genetic code, and then put that into a living, and created a living organism, a, a new cell that has that now. And we have this tremendous power now to basically create any kind of living organism we want. Just go on a computer, decide what DNA you want, and then put that into a, a synthesis machine and create that and put it into a living uh, cell that works. There's, a, there's a, a, pro, uh, a, a contest now MIT does with about 130 uh, uh, undergraduate colleges across the, the country and actually around the world who uh, create new bugs every year, new critters, using these little uh, pieces you can buy online from this MIT biobank source, almost like Lego piece. And you can create new bugs that do all kinds of things. Um, there's now a whole DIY bio movement to basically do this in your garage or create new organisms. Tremendous power, but also creating a lot of concern by security agencies, you can imagine, of bioterrorism. Uh, professors that will help her. I don't know if any of you have come across this now, but in, in universities now, a lot of our students are now taking cognitive enhancing drugs. Provigil, uh, Adderall, Ritalin. Uh, I asked my law, science, and technology class, 100 students, how many of you know someone in this uh, school taking them? They all put up their hands. Um, uh, many of the students have come to me and say they, they do take them they, to, to help them study better. Uh, I have to admit, I just tried my first Provigil. One of my colleagues gave it to me. I didn't see much of a difference, but he claims he can do tremendous work. This author in Nature said, you know, I got much more done in one night trying this than I do in a whole month. Uh, so this is just proliferating in an academic world, and I think a lot of uh, law firms maybe of young associates you have to uh, use uh, long hours. I've heard stories of them using this. These are all, uh, you know, not prescribed for this purpose, but the number of, for example, provigil prescriptions, it's approved for narcolepsy. There's 10 times as many prescriptions in the United States right now as there are narcolepsy people. So th a lot of these are being prescribed for other purposes, and people are getting them. You, I, ask, I ask my students, where do you get them? They just say, go into Hayden Library. Apparently, you walk in, there's people selling them on the black market. So we're quickly moving into this era, of, and it creates all kinds of equality and, and equality issues that some students have these and others don't. The students who don't are getting stressed out. Maybe I need to take them. We don't know what the health impacts of this really are. Uh, so there's concerns about that. 
all kinds of different types of uh, human brain machine interfaces um, where you basically put machines into your brains. There's people who can now, quadriplegic can now compose and send an email just thinking about it uh, with a remote connection to a computer. There's computer games on the market now where you just put a little helmet on your head and you control it all with your thoughts. You don't have to touch anything. You control the game on the TV. Um, there's these uh, um, deep brain stimulation being developed for things like Parkinson's and, and other types of tech, uh, diseases. And you basically got a little device that you control here and people have found that it basically can control their emotions. So if they're feeling kind of down, they just turn the button, they feel better. And people are talking about doing this for all of us. You know, you, if you're sort of down that day, you turn up your device a little bit. If you're down, you turn, it's just a little probe in your brain. Um, there's a recent report I was reading of a woman who had this, and it's somehow stimulating sexual pleasure in her. And she's become addicted to it. She does it something like 14,000 times a day. She's had to quit her job. Her fingers are all calloused and, and cut from constantly stimulating herself, and she's become addicted to this, and completely a, a recluse from society because of this. And she asked the doctor to take it out, and then she demanded it go back in. Uh, and there's been a number of examples like this that were basically got this power to now control our mental capacity, and, and the question is, do we want that? All kinds of funky things with robotics. This uh, yellow one here is in Japan. It babysits your children. You can uh, hire this uh, robot to do this. Um, we have uh, autonomous lethal robots now that will shoot uh, autonomously. And, and there's one at the Korean border, for example, that at night it becomes autonomous. So if a poor little deer walks along, it gets shot by the robot. Um, and hopefully a pe not people. People now want to get married to their robots. Um, all kinds of crazy things. 3D printers. This is a fascinating new technology where you can now print at your home. You can commercialize buy a 3D printer and print all kinds of devices right in your home of 3D objects. And it's getting more and more sophisticated what you can produce. You just design it on your computer, send it to your printer, and it prints it. Uh, a device, an object right there uh, in your own home. And these are uh, now for, available for several thousand dollars and going to come down quickly. Geoengineering, you've probably heard a lot about, that we're basically uh, uh, be able to do things on the earth. All kinds of genetically modified animals and plants. We're just going through the first genetically engineered um, fish coming onto the market, we have fluorescent uh, rabbits, we have uh, blue roses now, and we're just getting started in that. Pervasive computing, where you have all kinds of uh, technologies basically interacting with you in all kinds of ways. My wife just brought a, a Mini Cooper. When you go by the Mini Cooper uh, billboard now, it pops up your name and says, hello, new car owner, uh, Don, or this, this ad is Kate. It recognizes you and, and, and sends a message to you. Um, you have these little VeraChip implants, that are, uh, an RFID implant you can put into your body to have your medical records, or it can be used for a lot of other purposes. There's some bars in Europe, for example, that they put it in their patrons, and you get a free drink when you walk in uh, this restaurant. They recognize you're there. Um, Large Hadron Collider, I just sort of threw this in as a lark. This is this big thing that got turned on in, in Europe. You may have heard about this. What was sort of interesting about this is that uh, there's this claim that when they turn it on, it would destroy the Earth. It would turn us all into a black hole and we would cease to exist. Um, and uh, they had a story on NPR about it. It was kind of interesting because they had the scientists saying, you know, I don't think it's really likely, but there's a significant probability this could happen. And the, the scientists on the other side said it's actually extremely small probability. And you really want them to say zero, right? But from a scientific perspective, I guess you can't do that. But anyhow, it went to the European Court, uh, Court of First Instance, and they put, basically did a, a briefing order that would require the briefs to be filed about two months after this thing got turned on. Uh, and so the Earth would either exist or not at that point. And then finally, uh, uh, negligible senescence. There's, there's people who are doing this work to basically extend lifespan uh, dramatically with just really interesting science they're doing. This is legitimate science. It's at Cambridge University doing all kinds of fascinating things that were really unthinkable a few years ago. And this one guy, Aubrey de Grey, who heads this center there, has said the first 150-year-old has probably been born, and the first 1,000-year-old probably 20 years younger than the first 150-year-old. Uh, create all kinds of legal implications, particularly lifetime appointments for judges, if that becomes the case. <laughs> So we have just all these amazing tech, that one's a little bit more science fiction, but it's, it, there's real drugs, things being developed with these, these projects. So just let me conclude by just talking about some of the impacts. These things are all coming at the same time. Dramatic changes in our life, our society, our, our legal system, and they're all hitting in the next few years, all at the same time. And that's sort of the remarkable period we're in. It's really going to mean the way we traditionally regulate is completely obsolete. This idea of sort of top-down command and control regulation with this expert agency, so-called, who's basically going to think about this and pr produce regulations, it just won't work. I mean, by the time they propose regulation, the technology is going to be gone and by them. So to the extent we have oversight and governance, I think we have to look at completely different types of models. I think this is an interesting one in nanotech, where you have a major company partnering with an NGO, environmental group, and together sort of creating this partnership to screen products and put them through a, a battery of tests. 
no government involved at all. This has you know, done much more than government's been able to do because of how fast this is moving. Uh, reality is that courts are often going to be on the front line because our legislatures and our regulatory agencies won't have time to deal with this. For example, on the cell phone data issue, all the cell phone providers went to the FCC in 2002, asked for some clarification of what kind of data they should collect, how long they should keep it for, who they should give it to, can they sell it. And the FCC said in 2002, we're still working on that. There's still no real government policy on that eight years later. So courts are having to deal with this sort of as a, as a first instance, even though they don't want to be policymakers, they're having to. We're getting all kinds of new types of risks. We've sort of been dealing with cancer risks and things like that with technologies. Now we have what's called the yuck factor. These people are basically having um, uh, uh, you know, ethical or social concerns about these technologies and we're completely unequipped to deal with those. How should we deal with those? They often intersect with religious views. Do we want our government getting into that or not? And yet it's you know, a, a significant part of our population has those concerns so we don't want to just shut it out. So that's creating a huge, I think, issue of how we deal with those. The international aspects of these technologies are, are really challenging. Um, we mentioned that the internet is a, a global technology. Just in the next few months, we're now going to go where you can not only use uh, uh, English symbols, you can use Chinese and, and Arabic and so on. It's, you know, the idea of having a, a single global internet is, is, is quickly, in some ways, fracturing. Um, how do we control that? Nanotech is, is a global technology. Um, you know, more and more, if we want to deal with any of these technologies, we're going to have to deal with it on a global uh, level, which is going to be extremely hard. I mean, it's hard enough to just figuring out what we don't want to do in the United States, to have to bring in all these other countries is going to be very difficult. We're going to have a lot of disruption of, of, of existing uh, companies and products and, and whole industries. I mean, the, the manual typewriter is, uh, is gone. I mean, Blockbuster is going to be gone, and this thing can go an online model. All these technologies are going to be come and gone. I was just at a synthetic biology meeting a couple of weeks ago, and one of the big issues is that a lot of the, the materials that developing countries uh, sell and is basically their economy, we're not going to be able to create in the laboratory. And, and what's that going to do to those countries? Is it going to cause economic collapse? Is it going to cause destabilization? Do we have any ethical or, or self-interested duty to do anything about that. I think as we, we displace more and more people quicker and quicker, those issues will come up. And then uh, one of the things I think is going to really come to the forefront, and we're seeing this already, is the precautionary principle, this idea that originated in Europe. Uh, we've been somewhat resistant to it here, but the, a lot of the critics of these technologies are, are using this as sort of a prime example of, of to use a precautionary principle uh, to basically shut down these kind of technologies. And yet, on the other hand, they, 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 all of them, the reason they're going forward is they have tremendous benefits. And so to me, and, and as Kat Sunstein recently said, it's really showing the sort of the, the bankruptcy of the precautionary principle because most of these things are going to do more good than, than ban, and, and, and so to, to ban them would actually be doing more harm than good. In other words, the precautionary principle would say no precautionary principle. So here's my, just on that note, my concluding thing, uh, something's just not right, our air is clean, our water is pure, uh, we all have plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet no one lives past 30. So these technologies do a lot of good as well as the, the risks. Um, so I went very quickly, I know, but I wanted to leave uh, 10 or 15 minutes for any questions or comments, so uh, the floor is open. Thank you, Professor. Very interesting presentation. It's uh, somewhat exciting and also very terrifying to hear all of this. Uh, my question is, how will the law keep up with all of this? Are you aware of any courts or legislative bodies starting to implement uh, procedures or processes for, for uh, keeping up? the law a, with the technology? It's a, it's a great question. I just got an NSF grant called the Pacing Project to do that exact issue to show we have a huge problem, that there's just no way our, our three branches of, of law, gov legislatures, regulatory agencies, and courts can possibly keep up with these technologies, how fast they're going. And we need some new models. And unfortunately, uh, my grant got funded, and so now I have to come up with solutions. And I'm suddenly realizing, uh, I, I may have cut off more than I can, can chew here, this is going to be a huge problem to figure out solutions. But there, there are some interesting ideas out there. I mean, Michigan came up with this idea of a cyber court to go much more quickly. I think uh, the idea of, of relying on command and control, sort of government top-down regulation is increasingly going to be obsolete. It's just not going to work in this fast-moving world. We need to have much more flexible ways of doing things. Uh, instead of treating companies as sort of the enemy, as, as they need to be brought in as partners. They have the expertise. They're the ones on the front line. They need to be, uh, uh, be part of the sort of these cooperative type of, of programs. I think they have a self-interest in making sure these technologies aren't going to backfire like asbestos. They're going to be put out of business if they are. So I think, you know, we we need to move out of our 70s mind frame into more, I think, 21st century models. But so there, there are some ideas out there, but it's extremely challenging to figure out how we're going to move our, you know, our, our legislature, which are just so slow, and our regulatory agencies in any kind of effective way. 
If anyone has any ideas, by the way, I'm looking for ideas. <laughs> I guess since nobody else was in line, uh, I'll ask a question. So my question is maybe the inability to keep up can perhaps be thought of as a good thing in that if you believe, as I do, I think some in this room may also believe that there's a tendency towards over-regulation. If you have a uh, large portion of the economy that the regulators will have difficulty keeping up with, then maybe that's a good thing. I don't want to poo-poo the idea there can also be some harms as right. well, but right. if you believe on net that there's a tendency towards over-regulation, then maybe this is an opportunity, so to speak, to apply the precautionary principle to new regulation, right. uh, and the faster the economy moves, the the more perhaps we can do that in some ways, at least. I, I think that's a valid point and a good point. I mean, I guess one of the concerns is that if regulators feel they're being left behind, that they will act in a precipitous way to put in place an inappropriate regulation just to have something that, that doesn't fit. And so there's a, a risk of that. But yeah, if, if, if it's going so fast that they can't keep up, maybe that will uh, uh, cause them not to regulate, you would hope. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how that is. I guess the only other thing I would say is that one of the things that polls on these technologies show is that people are very uncomfortable if there isn't a government role. And so how do you uh, deal with that issue of this sort of confidence? And we had in the 80s, you know, the, the biotech industry came to the Reagan administration and said, regulate us. We are concerned that, you know, all these states and uh, tort lawyers are going off on us. We want sort of a, a reasonable set of regulations we can follow, and we're prepared to do that. I think it'd be very hard to put in place reasonable regulations on these technologies moving, so we don't even know what they are. But there is that a aspect as well we've got to think about. Yeah. One of the things that worries me the most is that anytime you have a system hooked up to a computer, if it has a microprocessor in it, it can be hacked, it can be uh, implanted with a virus or a Trojan, it can be taken control of by an external yeah. source. We even see these crossing uh, international boundaries with, right. uh, with examples like the Stuxnet worm. Uh, right. Their thing was either developed by either Israel or the U.S. as right. a way to shut down the Iranian nuclear project. Right. Uh, one of my concerns is if, if one of these systems is compromised, who is, res who is responsible? Is it the person who left their, uh, their, who left their brain on guard? Is it the person who did the hacking? Right. Is it the person who designed the system? How, how are you going to apportion right. liability right. when something like this goes horribly, horribly wrong? And it probably will. Yeah. Well, so first of all, I totally agree with you. This is a huge problem. I mean, as we store more and more electronically, which we need to do, I think. I, there's just no way around it. We just can't do everything we're doing on paper. I mean, we're going that way for the medical system with electronic health records and so on. But as you say, they are then vulnerable. We just had an incident this week where China diverted a very large percentage the world's email through their screeners to, to know who knows what they're doing with it, but you know, it seemed to be completely inappropriate, but they had the ability to do that because our, our internet is, is flowing all over the world and even our some of our military thing can be intercepted by a country like China and, and, and viewed. So it's very discerning about how we ensure security of all this information as we're putting more and more online. Um, so I, I think that that is a huge problem in terms of, you know, liability for these kind of things. It, again, it's, a, it's, 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 it's new models. I mean, it's basically the way we traditionally thought of a single person. I mean, the same thing I'm dealing with right now on a paper on, on liability for robots. Is it the designer of the robot? Is it the owner of the robot? Is it the uh, manufacturer of the robot? You can see all these different possible uh, responsibilities if that robot was to accidentally hurt someone or kill someone and yet none of them alone seem to be sufficient so it's creating new challenges for our whole liability system as well and it's going to be up to judges to decide that. I'm just curious I, I heard, heard you this, uh, give this talk, talk or a summer, summer talk once before uh, about the speed with which you expect that this to happen that sometimes it seems as though there's tendency for people to get the general trend right, but, exa uh, but exaggerate the speed. And I wonder right. if you'd care to comment on that. Sure, there's a lot of hype about that. Um, uh, you, you know, even that projection I showed you of, 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 of four, three trillion dollar, we're not on pace for that. We're pretty close, but not completely on, on track with that. Um, I forget who said it, it might have been Arthur C. Clarke. We tend to overestimate the impact and speed of technology in the short term and underestimate them in the long term. I mean, the, the thing about these technologies, things like these genetics, I, you know, I did a PhD in genetics 25 years ago. Everything I learned is completely obsolete now. But, you know, people were talking in five or ten years a lot of this stuff would be here. A lot of it is here now. That's a different thing. That's why I sort of intentionally focus this talk on things that are here today. Uh, because there has been so many examples of overstated and hype about a lot of these technologies. And I actually collected some examples of just outrageous hype that's made about some of these technologies. And so that's something that's always got to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but the, the thing is, is just what's remarkable, is, is the ones I'm talking about today are all things that are here today. There's real companies, real products, and real cases. Um, it seems something as uh, inherently conservative as law 
being agents of the dead who rule over the, you know, the living. Um, we could give up many things uh, in, the, in the past, but it, some of these even challenge core concepts. First one being jurisdiction or any sort of con con you know, conception of how that works, and then even possibly sovereignty. Yeah. And whether or not, I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating issue. I mean, there's examples in Second Life. I mean, so Second Life is available in any country in the world, and you have people uh, doing different things on there that violate laws in some countries, but not others. And so the question is, who has jurisdiction over that? Uh, there's a fascinating case that came out of the 11th Circuit. Uh, I don't know if any of you were involved in that or not, but um, uh, um, it had to do with an adult entertainment ordinance of the city of Tampa Bay, which basically prohibited any adult entertainment in the re residential parts of Tampa Bay. And this company created this uh, website called um, Cyber Dorm or something like that, or Coed Dorm or something like that, which was young women partially clad, and you basically had videos all around the house watching them all the time. So it was seemed to be clearly adult entertainment. It was you know, aimed at that market. It was selling this. People would pay money to see this online. And the, so the city, and it was in a house in the residential area of Tampa Bay. So the Tampa Bay authorities brought an action against them. It seemed open and shut. It went up to the 11th Circuit, and the 11th Circuit held that the violating action did not occur in Tampa Bay residential area. It occurred in cyberspace, and therefore Tampa Bay didn't have jurisdiction over it. A fascinating decision to think, you know, that means that no court would have jurisdiction because no one has control over cyberspace then, right? So that's one of the issues is where does these acts occur where, you know, you've got people in different jurisdictions, maybe different countries, with an internet server somewhere else with this uh, material going through all different kinds of countries, rooting, and then ending up being watched by people all around the world. You know, where does the jurisdiction lay? I mean, it's a very complicated issue and there's no good answer again. Yeah. And I think this is a bit of a follow-up on Ilya's point that maybe it's not so bad that the regulators can't keep up. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that context, I wanted to point to some things that were considered to be, you know, very fastly emerging technologies that created, in a sense, their own self-ordered systems of law that we then came to adopt. For I'm thinking, for instance, water law in the West, mm -hmm. I think, is a good example. So it didn't move at precisely the same pace, but perhaps an analogously to our understanding of how fast the common law forms, say, compared to wa water law there. Right. And, and so, and, and I think also to, to that, that kind of self-ordering perspective that people have brought to the cyber community, for instance, when they decide, uh, or rightfully or wrongfully, that Google's violating their privacy rights, so then there becomes an individualistic or private movement to abandon Google right. or to, you know, to bring pressure for those kind of things. And, right. I, and I tend to think in a fast-moving uh, society, yeah, you, you could get it wrong, right. but I'm not sure that the, that the dangers are such that the regulators have to jump in. Right. Uh, no, I, I agree with you completely, and I think um, I think there will be a temptation for them to try to do so, though. That's going to be one of the problems, and we're going to end up with, and, and I can cite some examples coming up in the next year, for example, nanotech, that I think that's going to happen. Um, but you're right. I mean, so this is what's interesting is it's, it's, you know, it does present some fears and some concerns, but it also presents tremendous opportunities, I think, for, for looking at new ways of governance, a much more bottom-up, uh, self-ordering type of models uh, that you see, as you said, on the internet is a great model of seeing some of these things. You know, w I haven't figured out how to really work Second Life yet, but some of my students go on and they tell me about these democracy islands and so on, that basically these ground up creating new ways of structuring their relationships without some top-down government telling you how to do it. Of, and if you don't like it, go to a different place, right? And so there's some really interesting opportunities here as well as some risks, I think. Thanks. Well, Professor, uh, that was a truly extraordinary set of remarks, Professor. Thank you very much. I don't know if you know Professor Richard Epstein, uh, but if I had the power to give you an award, it would be the Richard Epstein Award for fast talking and conveying a, an awful lot of information in a short period of time. So thank you very much. Uh, we are now closing the convention for the year. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you so much for being here this year, and thank you for everything you do for the society. And let me just, in their absence, thank the staff for all their hard efforts. I hope you've enjoyed the convention as much as they have enjoyed putting it together. Our closing reception is going to be downstairs in the Colonial Room. You go down the end of this hall. There are stairs that you can go down as, and elevators as well. Thank you.